Hey, how are you all doing? All right? So have you, have you seen this small film, Guardians of the Galaxy, at all? Have you heard of it? <laughs> all right. Well, I do want to introduce the uh, main people you're here to see, the two editors for Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. We have Fred Raskin. Hey, guys. And Greg Dorier. So what do you want to talk about? No, just kidding. Um, so well, I want to talk about Barbie. All right. <laughs> it's a pretty hot topic too these days, right? So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, kick off just a little bit. I want to find out, did uh, you want to be editors when you were growing up? Um, so I went to NYU film school. Um, that we could expect maybe two of, our, uh, of my classmates would, would get the opportunity to direct. So um, on the off chance that, that I wasn't going to be one of those two, I thought I should focus on a craft. And editing was always my favorite part of the process. Um, and frankly, the closest to directing. Like, you, you, you're, you're crafting performances, you're figuring out how to tell a story visually, um, and you can do it all from the comfort of an air-conditioned room. So you don't, you don't, you don't, need, you don't need to deal with, with, uh, with, with actors revolting or, or crew revolting. It's, it's really just all on you. And, uh, and so that's what I gravitated toward and kind of told all my friends, um, if you need an editor for your student projects, keep me in mind. Um, and came out to LA with the goal of uh, like starting as, as an apprentice editor and working my way up. And a pretty great career in editing. And I've been very lucky, yes. <laughs> and you, Greg? No. All right. I, I had, <laughs> I, is this on? Again, here we go. Yeah. Um, I stumbled into editing. And when I did stumble into it, uh, within a week, I was like, this is the place to be. And I never looked back. But I had no clue what editors did and what post-production was about for several years. Where did you go to school? I mean, where, where did you learn editing? Uh, Larry's Academy in, in Pacoima. Ah, nice. <laughs> well, very good. And the interesting thing is I know a lot of editors who've moved into directing as well. I mean, are you, do, do you still want to direct or? Uh... Eh, we'll see what happens. There you go. <laughs> All right, so you've been working together for like 20 years now, right? I oh God! Think longer, actually, right? <laughs> it, it does feel longer than that. <laughs> well, how how did you start? How did you meet, or how did you start working together? So Greg might remember this differently, but but uh, one one of my class uh, fellow classmates at NYU, um, a guy named Mike Spinelli, was uh, Greg's post PA on uh, Halloween H two O. And uh, they needed another uh, another assistant editor to help out in the cutting room, um, and called me. That's pretty much how it happened. <laughs> so you started out assisting, right, on yeah. Halloween, and then grew into. Yeah, we needed help in the film department, and again, it, it, Mike was our post PA, uh, had gone to NYU with Fred, and recommended Fred and. Fred was fantastic, and also a great guy to be around. And then as far as moving into this world of Marvel and superheroes, I mean, Fred's been first Guardians, second Guardians, and third Guardians, so the whole way through. And Greg, when did you come on? Uh, I came on for the Guardians holiday special. Oh. You all but see that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> Just to, to expand a little bit on that, because um, it, it's not so much my being in the Marvel world, it's me being in the James Gunn world. And, uh, and Greg really joined us on the Peacemaker TV show. Um, he, he, he was, was one, of, one of the three editors that we had work, working on the show, and, that's, and, and James really fell in love with his work, and, uh, and that's why he came on to cut the, uh, the holiday special. Oh, perfect. So as far as Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, what was your production timeline? I mean, how long was production, post-production, just a generalization? So I, I think production was, it was five or six months. I, ca I can't remember exactly which, and, and, then, and then it was another year after that um, before we were completely finished. And as far as working, I mean, it also was a time during COVID. So, I mean, times have changed in the way you worked from the first Guardians to, to this one. Uh, did you go on set for volume three? Did you not? Were you working on, lot, on the lot? Were you working remote? Can you talk about that? Um, so, 
I was on location for the first two Guardians movies uh, and the Suicide Squad, which James also directed. And, and then um, on this, because this happened, uh, like we'd already had the pandemic experience um, with both the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker. Um, and James really got used to the idea of working remotely, and we, we would just send him cuts. Uh, uh, um, uh, we just post it for him via Pix, and he, he would just watch, watch the stuff online and give us notes. Um, and so by the time production started on, uh, on Guardians 3, th it, there was no real reason for us to be on location. Um, he could do all the inter interacting with us that he needed to, uh, S simply vi via text, email, phone call, and watching stuff on pics. So, uh, so no, I, I was not on location for this one. Um, and I can't, I can't, when did the holiday special start? It was was it in January of twenty two? It was February of, of twenty two. And same thing, working from home, which I love the experience of working from home. There's nothing better than being in your sweatpants <laughs> at like two o'clock in the morning, and you're just comfortably working on your your sequences. It's it, mentally, it's so much more relaxing than having to get in a car and drive an hour and then go for X amount of hours and then you wonder as you're fatigued at the end of the night, even though I know I still have more work to do, but I'm really tired and I should probably get home. Now when you're working at home, the commute is like 20 seconds from the cutting room to my uh, bed. It's the best. Greg does not have young children at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's your fault. <laughs> I did nothing with your young children. <laughs> I did nothing with my young children. My wife did all that work. All right, so uh, talking about being on set or not, do you like being on set? Do you prefer not? Is it no. <laughs> we need a little, little more there. Well, I, I, I actually, I do really feel like, I, I know there is some trend where directors like to have their editors on set. I think that, that that's a mistake, that you should, you should be separate from that process. So, so when you see the material, you have no idea whatsoever what it took to get that shot or, or the scene. You should be looking at the material completely unbiased so that when you make decisions, you're not thinking, wow, it took us to X amount of hours to pull that off. I think it's a, a big mistake. I, I like the fact that I'm uh, removed from the challenges of, of what's going on on the set. I mean, that's really valid. Now, a lot of people like to be on set to say, okay, we really need to shoot something so I have better coverage. So, but some people do like to have you know, that, that fresh look at the footage. Uh, but honestly, there's nothing preventing you from doing that working remotely. Like you still, you're, you're looking at all the footage and can still make recommendations in terms of something that you think we might need. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have a clip. Star-Lord and Nebula and Drax, they, they basically come into the Bat family home and you know have a little experience there and then need to run out quickly. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the reason we'd selected the, the, the clip that we'd selected was, was because I had cut the first half, and Greg had cut the second half. Um, so it was it was a fun little way for you to, to see our, our, our individual contributions. Um, but and I think also, kind of more importantly, it would have led into a way for us to talk about how these movies are shot. Um, one of the interesting things is that the basic way that the movies are shot hasn't changed since we did the first one, um, w which is primarily when dealing with the CG characters. Um, if you have a scene uh, that involves Rocket or Groot, they're, uh, the, the way they would shoot these things is they do the first take of every setup with a stand-in for that character. Um, with Rocket, it's James's brother, Sean, um, uh, down on his haunches, um, performing the scene for, for the, uh, so that the rest of the cast knows where they're supposed to be looking, um, they know what they're reacting to, and the camera operators know how to frame properly. Um, because they will do the all the remaining takes without uh, Sean or, or whichever actor it is uh, in that place. But it's really valuable for us to have that first take because that's what we use in the cutting room so that we know we have something to cut to. Um, so we all w and and the animators. I, I, I would say if one thing has changed and it's really just a slight change from when we made the first movie, uh, it's that. James has become more reliant on uh, Sean's performance on set 
um, I think on the first movie, Sean would, would do his best in that one take, and then if James wanted anything more from the character, he would direct the animators to bring it out um, when Rocket was animated. Uh, now, uh, James is, is very careful to make sure that he gets what he wants from Sean as Rocket. Um, which really does uh, create more of the humanity of the character. One of the other reasons why we're going to show the clip is because, again, Fred was working from his home. I was working from my home. Fred worked on uh, the first part of the sequence, which was uh, the Guardians inside the Bat Family home. And then I worked on the, the next scene, which was uh, Quill and Nebula um, getting into the car and driving away. Um, and Part of the uh, editing sort of experience was Fred was sending that separately to James. I was sending mine separately. And at a certain point, James, so that he could get a sense of how long to sort of stay with the comedy of, of, of those scenes, he needed to see both of those scenes put together. So once we started sending the scenes together, James could have a better sense of how much of the comedy in the first scene to pull back and definitely how much of the comedy in my scene to pull back. And it was really interesting because once we, we pulled back, there were areas of my scene that got laughs with an audience that we had never gotten before. So that was an interesting part of the process that if we'd shown the scene, I could have pointed out sort of specifically. And I'm finding my hand is shaking. This is, this is very nervous. <laughs> I think you all. One, one, of, one of the main things that I have cut in the Guardians movies, um, I, I've done the majority of the scenes uh, between the entire team um, with, with the group dynamics, with them playing off each other and bickering with each other. And, and, uh, and so when James shot that scene, he specifically said to me, Fred, I want you cutting that scene. Um, he, he was not specific about the scene that followed, and uh, really, for the most part, we have our big sequences, and then there's anything that James assigns, and then the rest is up for grabs. Um, and the, the scene that followed was technically a separate scene number, it was not shot on the same day, and so uh, I was doing something when that scene came in, and, and, uh, and, so, and I'll, I'll, I, I want to acknowledge, actually, the, the, the other person who's not here with us, uh, which is Tatiana Regal, um, was, was with us during production while Greg was cutting the, uh, the holiday special. Um, she was cutting alongside me on, uh, on Guardians 3, um, but she departed just before the end of production when Greg finished uh, the director's cut of the holiday special. Are they're all, they're all still <laughs> what? We'll try them both. You have the clip? Oh my God. <laughs> we have clip. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All right. Friends, so you you for Come on, Lord. Yeah, yeah, sit. Let's sit. Okay. I am grouped. It's not rude. It's what it's here for. Drax, sit up! Idiot. Thank you. So liso. Uh, thank you. What's up? Our friend is dying. Uh, we love our friend, but he is dying. That's not dying. That's already dead. They'll think he's already dead. They'll think we're here on a quest for revenge. Drax? Sit up! That's what it's here for. Drax, it isn't. It's made for people to sit shoulder to shoulder right next to each other. Get your boots off her pillows. I'll find it hard to believe. It doesn't have multiple purposes. I'm sorry. My friend 
is a dumbass. Yeah. That's the same as you're dying. Why do you criticize everything? Why is it oblong then? It was a totally different sound. Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, dying, uh, dumbass. See, it's the same. All right, guys, can I proceed, please, to try to save our friend? Drax, I see you. I understand that none of this makes any sense to you right now. We need your help in finding a man. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw the man that we're looking for. Like this. You see the thing on her head? He has a thing. That is delightful. Like this. Mm. There you go. Have you seen this man? That's very good. Can I have that later to hang on my apartment, please? Yeah. Thank you. Motio. His name? His name is Motio? Ew. Ew. Motilio, Motilio, Dado. Motio's egg. Lolo. Many Motios. Oh. There? Oh. At the pyramid. Oh. Is that your car in the driveway? Oh. Hell. Drax, stay here with Rocket. Watch him. That's who they're coming for. I want to come. No. Mantis, watch Drax. Group, you know what to do with these. down on it. What? Push it down. I am pushing down on it. Push the button. It looks like you're pushing the keyhole. The what? There's a button under the handle. Press that in. Okay. Now what? Open the fucking door. That is a stupid design. And your instructions were very unclear. Let's get that pass key and save our friend. I was eight years old when I left Earth, okay? Why would I know any more about driving one of these things than you do? Don't see you volunteering. You want me to drive? No. I'll drive. I don't want you to drive. I got this. So let me jump in for a moment because I heard some people laughing there toward the end when we're seeing uh, we're seeing Gamora seeing the car. That's what specifically what I'm talking about. When that scene in the car was longer, for some reason, those moments didn't get laughs. But once we sort of pared down the essence of the comedy of that scene, you know, suddenly we found that those moments got laughs. So that's one of the things that. You know, again, when you discover through editing, and especially with comedy, how much is too much, and how much is sort of just right. I think you also mentioned when we were standing on the side about the the shot just with uh, Nebula. Uh, uh, you saw a scene that had apparently one of the trickier visual effects shots to pull off, which was the close up when Nebula is pushing the keyhole as opposed to the button, and. Uh, I had done a, a temp comp where I grabbed uh, some sections to make that work, and then you hand it off to the pros and they really make it work. Well, I had overheard Steph, our VFX supervisor, at one point saying that that shot took a lot longer and was a lot harder to execute than they had imagined. And I never would have thought that stupid little close-up would have been difficult to pull off. In a major VFX heavy film. <laughs> yeah, would, I mean, there was at least 10 or 20 visual effects shots in the entire film. A few, so, yeah. yeah, just a few. <laughs> so um, I understand there was, uh, you, you did some VO temp work also in the film. I was listening to the podcast, and uh, did, wh who did you temp <laughs> in it? I, I, I will tell you one of the, th I'm going to let Fred take this, but a bitter moment for me was when um, Rocket 
shoots the high evolutionary and, and the guards are coming down for the, for the gun battle with Rocket, I had voiced uh, down here or something like that, and a better performance than I did right now. Like well, really that good. good. That was really good. No, that, that one was not good. <laughs> but the one that I had done was really good. And they replaced it with a professional voice actor. So th this whole topic of temp VO is a little bit, it's a bitter swill for me, bitter pill for me to swallow. <laughs> um, uh, to be fair, the same thing happened to me. And uh, actually, uh, we, we should acknowledge we're in the presence of one of our super talented voiceover artists, <laughs> Greg's wife, Helene. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> one, 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 of, one of the fun things about uh, this whole working from home process is, uh, you know, whenever, whenever you need a temp line, um, <laughs> you're just turning to your wife <laughs> or, or you're doing it yourself. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, and so yeah, bo both of our wives played Nebula at one point. <laughs> um, and uh, I, th I think um, the... the, the the, the, the reason why Michael's bringing this up is that, uh, that there's a scene, uh, it, you know, the, 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 mov the movie alternates between flashbacks from Rocket's childhood uh, and then the present day stuff. And uh, in the, uh, the, the movie opens with a flashback, but the, the next flashback that follows uh, has R Rocket has been operated on and he's a little baby and, and he's been tossed into the cell with his cellmates and... Um, the first word that he says uh, as a baby, um, uh, when 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 we uh, when we're thinking about looping it, James James didn't want to have an adult like doing a child's voice because he felt that was going to be phony. He was like, "What we really need is a two-year-old," um, and uh, and so I said to James, "You, you know, you know, I've, I've got one of those at home," um, and uh, so that I, I then proceeded to uh, to follow my 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 little daughter Noah around with my iPhone, um, and whenever when I, it's 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 all of one word. <laughs> Um, and w whenever the opportunity presented itself, I was like, "Come on, Noah, say hurts." And, uh, and 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 it's in the movie. James James heard it, and he was like, "This is perfect. This is exactly what it should be." And uh, you know, of all the work I put into this movie, that is the thing of which I'm the most proud. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong. The the performance that made into the film, she had just woken up, and you seized upon. Her. Yeah, she was super cranky from be being woken <laughs> up, and I was like, "This is this is it. This is it. I'm gonna get it." <laughs> And then I, I want to share uh, a, a family member on the on the holiday special. Uh, there was a scene that involved an off-screen 911 operator, and so you know I grabbed my wife, uh, who graduated from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. She's very talented, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and so I grabbed her to voice those lines, and. Uh, they were in the special for the longest time. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, maybe I can angle to have my wife, you know, stay in the, in the show. And then there was one point on the film, uh, we were in the VFX review room, and there was a shot that involved um, Mantis that my wife, Helene, had voiced in the film. And James turned around and said, that's your wife, right? And I said, yes. And I said, by the way, James, when you have a moment, I have a question for you. He said, well, ask me now. And I said, well, you know, that's my wife in the holiday special uh, doing the 911 operator. Is there any chance maybe we can have her stay in the, in the show? He said, yeah. And so, there, and then so she ended up getting a, a day rate from, from SAG for something that took her all of like maybe 35 seconds to record. <laughs> So I mean, sound. I mean, music definitely plays a huge part in the film, and, and sound design. How much sound design do you do before it even gets handed off to the sound team? I mean, I know personally, my go-to is I use a lot, lot of stuff from like the old Roadrunner <laughs> cartoons. Um, no, I, I mean, we, 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 we do try to. Nobody laughed. <laughs> 
<laughs> we, 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 we try to, to sound design or to, uh, to, to fill out the sound as much as we possibly can. Um, one of the challenges that we had on this movie in particular is that because we started um, during the pandemic and were, uh, were working from home, um, the only options available to us were that we had to be working in stereo. Um, we didn't have the option of working in 5.1, and so that becomes challenging when you're eventually going to put the movie in a theater for a screen. Um, stereo generally isn't going to cut it. Um, so on this movie, um, we actually brought on, we had an, an in-house um, sound editor slash designer slash mixer. Um, we, had, we had Skywalker on the movie as well, um, who would, uh, you know, wh when we had big sequences, we would send them the, the sequences and, and they would provide us, you know, fully developed tracks. Um, but then we had our in-house mixer who worked on the Avid. Um, and, and if I can offer one piece of advice to any aspiring sound editors, it's learn the Avid because there aren't a lot of sound editors there who know it. And having the uh, having someone who was able to work with us, uh, like in the cutting room on our tracks, I mean, anything they did was automatically incorporated into the, into the tracks that we were working with and stayed there. Um, it, it was incredibly helpful. So so we we had we had three people over the course of the show, and 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 their their, their job um, was you know cutting any temp effects that we needed at, like at the last minute, mixing in the stuff from Skywalker, and converting our stereo tracks into 5.1. Um, and, and it was it incredibly helpful. Like I can't say enough wonderful things about these people. Um, in re-watching the movie last night, um, I just want to point out you know, some of the small things uh, about post-production involving both picture cutting and sound design and how it, it seems small, but it makes a big difference is um, there's a moment at the end of the scene where Gamora um, is angry at the crew because they're going to go fly off uh, to the orgo, orgo scope. And there's a shot where she walks away, and it's a one -er that sort of watches her walk down the, uh, this hallway, pans over to Quill, and Nebula, and then pans over to Mantis and Groot at the at the controls of of the Bowie. And originally, after that shot, we cut to a close up, uh, or, or actually a front angle shot of Groot in front of uh, the controls. And then we cut to the next scene, which is Nathan Fillion uh, dealing with uh, this uh, rogue Ravager that they captured. Um, Somewhere down the line, um, we decided to lose that front angle shot of Groot. And the other thing that we decided to do was we overlapped uh, the sound of the Bowie flying through uh, the, the jump point. We overlapped that into the start of the next scene, which was a shot of Nate tossing the Ravenger down on the chair. And so now suddenly, a transition that didn't have uh, much energy or wasn't very dynamic, just by simply removing that one shot and then adding that sound and having it bleed over into the next shot um, created this dynamic transition. And how dynamic a transition? My youngest son was out in the living room and who never leaves his bedroom. And he actually, without me saying anything, was like, wow, that's a really great transition, Dad. So, you know, that's it. And it's, that's sort of the magic of what we do is these little things where you, you remove one shot, you tweak sound, and you get something that's entirely different and, and so much better. It's part of the cool thing of what we do, I think. There, there are 3,000 cuts in this movie. Your son liked one of them. <laughs> uh, no, I think he liked about 13 or 14. Oh, great. <laughs> Most of them Fred's cuts. So just out of curiosity as well, I mean, I love 3D. I mean, I, if there's a movie in 3D, I will go see it because I just, I, I love it. I love the experience. A lot of people don't. I assume you didn't cut in 3D, but what, what are your thoughts about 3D? And I think I mean, there's something you want to talk about as far as seeing it in 3D and how it basically was enhanced uh, for this film. Yeah, um, I mean, th th this movie was not originally planned on being in 3D, um, but uh, Marvel 
I, I think they try to, uh, for foreign releases, they always do a 3D version. And um, I, I'm, I, for me, this, it's one of the, the really fun parts of the process because I, like, I love in-your-face 3D. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not subtle as far as this stuff is concerned. I want, I want stuff that's really coming out at you. For me, that's, that's part of the fun of it. Um, if you're gonna go see a 3D movie, that's, that's what you want. Um, and, uh, and so we, and, and Greg, Greg was like, I have no interest in 3D. <laughs> I, I actually find 3D conversions to be a crime against humanity. <laughs> Or he did until I said, sit in with us for one of these DI sessions. And within 10 <laughs> seconds of sitting in on one of these 3D conversions uh, uh, moments, I was like, this is fucking cool. <laughs> uh, I mean, there, there's, it's... It's great what the, what they're able to do. How much how much they're able to push it, push the in your face nature of it. Um, uh, you you kind of learn. You don't want something breaking the frame um, because because then it it it, uh, it ruins the illusion of, of it coming out into your face. Um, and and one of the fun things that we got to do uh, is uh, be, because there is a mixed aspect ratio version of the movie. Um, if you if you watch it on Disney Plus and you see it in um, what they're what they're calling wide screen is actually the mixed aspect ratio. So it alternates from 240 to, um, what is, it, is it 189, I think is the IMAX ratio? I think um, so. Uh, so it, it alternates between those two. And if there was an action sequence in one of the 240 sequences, um, if we wanted something really coming out at you, um, we actually had it break the 240 frame. So it goes into the mat so that it looks like it's, it's coming out at you. Uh, the, 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 the big hallway fight uh, that comes uh, you know, about half an hour before the end of the movie, uh, characters are getting cut in half and blood is spraying out at the, at the camera and it's breaking the frame and it, it couldn't be cooler. Um, and, and getting to see it like that, it was like, yeah, this is, this is the reason why I work on these kinds of movies. Uh, Marvel has a stereo team. I wish I knew specifically what, who their names were. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and again, as I said, I really was reticent uh, to even go into one of those sessions. And again, Fred, you know, as you can tell, is a big proponent of it. And from the moment I was in there, uh, I was blown away because I felt like it's if a, if a film isn't shot with three D cameras, it's kind of a gimmick. But these people that did the three D conversion are so talented, and the and the stereo separation of the images, it was just magical. So it almost felt like oh, it really was shot in three D. And and there's some of those. I, I loved it so much that I immediately was like, I'm going to go see this in 3D, and I went to IMAX 3D. And it really is, to see it in that way, is it's a completely different experience. And even in subtle ways, like, there, there were uh, shots that are, like, from a floor perspective. Like, I'm thinking uh, specifically the beginning of the flashback where the high evolutionary has Rocket on his lap, and they're talking about math and music. And that, that initial shot from the floor perspective in 3D just gave it this whole different feeling that you don't get with a, a 2D um, image. And then in particular, there's a great shot, uh, this big sweeping wide shot where the arete is, is rising from the water. And in the foreground, you have the water and you have these rippling waves coming at you the way that Fred Raskin really loves. And, and the feeling of, like, you really felt those waves coming at you and it, it made it a more immersive experience. So needless to say, I went in saying this is a crime against humanity, and I was like, <laughs> I think all of you should, should go out and see it in 3D, because it's that fun, and it's, it's that different. And it was quite a treat, because when I came out of the 3D screening at Century City, who's in the lobby but Fred Raskin and his wife <laughs> signing autographs. Uh, yeah. But no, it was actually a nice treat, and that's when I also heard that uh, his daughter played a part, and totally credited in the film as well. So, I mean, when you're cutting, you're not cutting 3D when you are no. working. That's all a post-conversion. You're not having to take certain things in consideration. They're all taking that uh, in afterwards. When you are working on such a, a heavy VFX film, and this, this film is very dark, a lot of emotional moments, a lot of great story, and a lot of VFX. Do you have a preference as to uh, 
what you like doing better? Now, mind you, you, you have basically everything in this film, but do you prefer spending more time on those emotional parts or more the VFX heavy part of the film? I, I know for me, I'm definitely, I, I love emotional moments. Um, personally, once I've, I've seen a film, I already know the story. So what's going to make me want to come back again is, is being emotionally invested. Um, and, you know, again, when you find certain emotional moments that, that kind of resonate over and over again. And one of the things I was telling Fred, because Fred did all the, the flashback stuff, and late in the game, uh, you know, the scene where Rocket uh, sees the young kits, the, the, the young raccoons, um, it was late in the game that VFX added, uh, you know, the effect of, of the single tear kind of streaming down Rocket's face. For close to a year, I'd never seen that. And then when I saw that, it just upped the emotional stakes. Uh, it, 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 it really changed how that scene resonated. It's almost, as, again, as if like, you know, if in, in the old days when you had real actors and they, they were directed uh, not to cry and then late in the game, someone said, no, let's use a take where they're crying. The whole nature of that of that scene changed for me at that moment. Um, so I I love cutting action, um, but I have to say on a movie like this, um, where that's so visual effects heavy, every single shot is planned out in advance, um, and so you, your your hands are definitely tied when you're cutting an action sequence on a movie like this. Um, because they figured out how they're gonna do every single shot and one shot leads into the next. Um, so for me, it, it, the, the, the scenes I was talking about earlier, like this, the scenes with the team where they're bickering with each other, that for me is, I have the most freedom there in terms of figuring out how the scene is gonna be constructed. And you know, obviously everything goes through James. Um, I, I don't wanna act like what I do is that that's what ends up in the movie. Um, but it certainly uh, provides the first step. And, uh, and, and we just have more freedom with scenes like that. And in, in the first movie, there's the 12% uh, the of a plan scene where, where the characters are all together like that was my favorite scene in the first movie and that was uh, that was a that was actually where James found the shooting style that he ended up employing on this movie because the first movie for the most part was a single camera movie but that scene where he had all the actors in the room together uh, he that was it was three cameras I think um, and uh, and that gave us uh, it gave me all this different material to work with um, and really finding all the quick little moments where, where you just want to cut to a character briefly having a, a reaction um, that, that really brought the movie to life and I think gave it a lot of the charm, uh, which is why people, people love these things. Do you have a favorite scene in this one? Um, <laughs> why am I totally blanking now? I mean, I love, I, I love the moment, yeah, actually, I've, I, th I've got two. I, I I love the scene on the surface of the Orgo, the whole the whole like space hog through the that's, conversation between Quill and Gamora. Um, but I also love that final moment between Quill and Gamora, and I'm not going to ruin it for for those of you who haven't seen it. But uh, but I think it's a really good emotional beat. When uh, doing like a really emotional scene, do they do a lot of the CG? Uh, ahead of time to help you come up with how to do the the emotional edit, or do you kind of have to edit blindly and then give recommendations on which shots to render out? What's the so so, is, so how the, much of a back the, and forth the, the, is there? The, the, this sort of comes back to, to what we were talking about earlier with uh, with Sean Gunn standing in for Rocket. Um, we we have we have we have a a legit actor um, who's terrific um, playing that part for. Uh, as as many takes as James needs to get the performance that he wants out of him, and that's what the animators base the the digital performance on. Um, so w as long as we have something solid there, now we also actually have the ability to come up with with something new when when it's one of the CG characters. And this was I forgot this part part of the reason why we were showing that clip is there's a moment in that scene when Drax is uh, uh, is, is 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 complaining about the couch and driving everybody nuts. Uh, uh, Groot looks at him and rolls his eyes. Um, that didn't happen it, uh, on set. That was. Uh, I'm sitting here looking at the footage, and I'm like, "Well, we have like we have a plate in, in like an empty frame where Groot should be. Um, it'd be funny if Groot was just like, 
Um, and, uh, and so I just typed on the screen, Groot, Groot rolls his eyes at Drax. And, uh, and the animators ran with that, and that's what you saw in the movie. So I mean, it's, it's, it's cool the amount of freedom that, that, that this gives us. We generally have really good performances that, that the animators can base uh, the digital characters on, and then, and then we're able to add to that also. I, I will say for me, because this is the, the first really heavily CG movie that I worked on, um, and what was kind of fun was watching a lot of times uh, there would be this stuffed doll like for Rocket that would be there on set. And it, it's just, there's something funny about here's this big complex uh, VFX film and the actors are working with like this stuffed dummy. All right, well, uh, unfortunately, we're, uh, they're going to play us off. We're going to be out of time. But I do want to get a quick selfie. Ooh, selfie. Awesome. Let me get but a selfie. <laughs> more importantly, I want to definitely thank Fred and Greg for joining us and for the great work that they've done on Guardians of the Galaxy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Sir, since, since you were kind enough to ask a question, um, I gift with you a special tr <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy cereal box. Wait, we need, we need to get a picture. Here, come on up. Come up here, get <laughs>